Thank you very much. I'm on a mission for, for Herbert Simon. Um, and um, I want to make him more known. Let's see if this works. It's good. Uh, I just point out a couple of things before I start that are not about the talk I'm about to give, but it's good to challenge our metaphors from time to time. We've been speaking about data as oil for the longest time, and we're speaking about how much data has been generated, you know, when the short while we saw our introductory uh, talk here, which I think is, is, is one possible metaphor. It's also interesting to ask oneself how much oil was produced in that time, how many dinosaurs died and decomposed and turned into oil. The answer to that question is zero. No new oil was produced, but a lot of new data was produced, and the doubling rate of data is roughly 12 months now, which means that you get more and more data all the time. So I would suggest to you a slightly cheesy but kind of fun metaphor that you can go with instead, and yes, I am from Google. Uh, it would be data as sunshine, a renewable source of energy and economy and entrepreneurship. It's a lovely thought. Just I'm going to leave that with you, and then we're going to talk about Herbert Simon. Now, Herbert Simon, is not coming when I click on this thingy magic. There we go. Okay, Herbert Simon is a source of deep intellectual envy to anyone who is even remotely interested in research. He um, got the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1978, but the most, um, the most impactful or the most amazing thing about him is that he was present at the birth of at least three completely pivotal sciences of the 20th century. So. Herbert Simon was one of the first people to interest himself in the issue of how people actually really behave in economy. Until he sat down and started to research on this, we all assumed that people maximize rationally between all of their different choices and their utilities. Turns out they don't. And with that, Simon was one of the founders of what we now know as behavioral economics, a really important piece of economics that uh, essentially shows us how people really behave in economic situations and upended much of the economic thought at the time. He then walked down the aisle in Stanford where he was active and spoke to a couple of other people about the nature and design of artifacts and became one of the founding fathers of what we know as design science. In fact, my first exposure to Simon was here in this house 20 years ago when Cecilia Katzev, who was heading up the lab I worked at at CISU, uh, handed me Sciences of the Artificial, a small, very readable book by Herbert Simon. Um, in which he sort of walks through how we can think about all of the human-designed artifacts around us. And then, I think, perhaps most importantly for me, he, together with Alan Newell and a lot of other people at Stanford, uh, was a part of the founding of artificial intelligence. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Learn about what? So what I want to talk about is this. I want to talk about the political design space for artificial intelligence. Um, my day job is to talk to people all over what we call EMEA, Europe, Middle East, Asia, Russia, Turkey, about technology and its social impact. And one of the things I think is really important is to bring that back to the researchers at Google and all of the other research communities that I'm a part of in order to have this ongoing constant dialogue between society and research when it comes to the technologies we develop. The possible design space for any given technology is vast. You can do a lot of different things, but the actual political design space, what we decide to to do together is much smaller. And figuring out the relationship between those two is what I will uh, ask Simon to help us do today. We will do it through uh, looking at three essays that he has written, and we're going to just skim through them very quickly. This is sort of a, um, a blinkist version of, of Herbert Simon, uh, but I would really recommend you to read them at length because they are certainly worth it and the time you invest in them. The first is an essay he wrote in, in the 80s called The Steam Engine and the Computer. This is an essay in which he studies the natural uh, uh, evolution of technological revolutions. And his first point, and perhaps the most important point, is that revolutions are slow. Technological revolutions are slow. The kind of urgency we're sometimes asked to feel is not necessarily the best way to deal with the quickly changing technical paradigm. The steam engine, he said, took 150 years until it thoroughly changed society. He even suggests a sort of constant for technological revolutions and says that any technology, any basic technological revolution, will take about six generations before it completely has changed the society. And he says there's no single technology at the heart 
of a technological revolution. In fact, what we see is always a web of different technologies growing slowly and enabling each other. With the steam engine, we saw the dynamo and then we saw electricity. With the computer, we saw the internet and then we saw connectivity. But it's not a single line, it's a web. And another part of the web that we're exploring now, and this goes back to the issue of AI, is this. With the computer, we've seen artificial intelligence, and we've seen the rise of something that is slowly approaching cognicity, which, you know, in analog with electricity, is the ability to take cognition and use that as a fundamental general purpose technology in whatever you're trying to build. Simon's other point is that we shape technological evolutions. They don't happen to us. Far too often we have the sense that technological evolution is something that is sort of implemented by someone else, or it's a deterministic force that rolls over us. This is not the case. And it, this particularly holds for the political design space. It expands slowly and in webs. When we talk to politicians today about artificial intelligence, they're really interested in understanding how it connects with all of the other different areas, and that's why we as researchers and uh, as um, policymakers and policy advisors have to be very careful and think about this. Um, it's interesting in many different ways, but specifically when it comes to, it comes to AI, this is true. Uh, I met with John McCarthy back in 2006, um, when AI celebrated its 50th anniversary. I, I looked him up outside of Stanford because I wanted to, to chat with him, and um, I, I asked him if he wasn't disappointed in the evolution of artificial intelligence at the time. And he looked at me and said, no, you're stupid. Um, <laughs> To which I said, ah, okay. <laughs> and I said, look, 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 it's really very simple. When Mendel had discovered inheritance, it took 50 years and nothing happened whatsoever. Then in the last 50 years, we sequenced the genome. We are only halfway through this technological revolution, and most of the stuff that will happen will happen in the second half. Unfortunately, McCarthy died, or he could have called me up every single day and told, you, and, and told me that he told, told me so, because he is right. If you look at the evolution of artificial intelligence post-2006 to now, you see a speed of development that is unmatched, I think, in the field itself. This is interesting for us as researchers, because this second half is when regulation comes when the political conversation needs to happen, when the social impact starts to become very tangible and real. Now, the second essay that we will use is one that is uh, very sympathetic to read. It's called Altruism and Economics. Simon never believed in economic man. He never believed in this hyper-rational actor that maximized utility. He instead launched, and this was what gave him the Nobel Prize, the notion of satisficing, the idea that we, we try to find out what's good enough. And we're more than happy to actually be altruistic about it too. Altruism, he said, is a real observable fact if you do ethnographic studies, if you look at how, how people behave. And if you want to do models of man, it needs, you need to, to take into account different kinds of biological boundaries. This is very true for the discussion we need to have about the political impact of technologies. All of the technologies we designed come with certain biological boundaries. In fact, sometimes those biological boundaries are the very reason we see a fundamental tension. Sociobiologist E.O. Wilson has a really brilliant uh, saying where he says that our society stands in front of a grand challenge. And the reason we have this grand challenge is that we are moving at different paces. We have Paleolithic emotions, Stone Age emotions. We have medieval institutions in most of our societies, and on top of that, we have godlike technology. The tension between those different layers, Wilson says, is what we have to resolve. And that is what bounds the political design space for us. This is evident in a lot of different cases when it comes to AI, but perhaps the most interesting one to have emerged in the last couple of, well, in the last 18 months, really, is the trade-off that we need to do between efficiency and auditability of artificial intelligence systems. We're now reaching levels of complexity such that we need to decide whether or not we want the system to be very efficient or auditable. If we want it to be highly um, exact, and give us a lot of really good results, or if we want to be able to review these systems. Sam Arbusman wrote a brilliant book called Overcomplicated, in which he predicts that in a 10 to 15 year, uh, year period, most of our systems will be incomprehensible to us, not because it's hard to explain them, but it will be an inherent quality of a system, not to be a black box, but he suggests a black organism. 
We need to move away from the metaphors of mechanistic explanation when it comes to computer software and instead shift into those of biological systems. The third essay, and the one where um, Herbert Simon most directly touches on the, the issue of AI and the reason for which we should be developing AI is called Designing Organizations for Information Rich Environments. In this essay, he's asked by the Brookings Institute, and this is in 1969, by the way, he's asked by the Brookings Institute to explain what they should do about the information overload. Surely, the Brookings Institute says in 1969, there's too much information already. How can we deal with this? And he refuses to write that paper. Instead, he writes a paper called Designing Organizations for Information Rich environments. He doesn't talk about the information overload. And the reason he does that, he says, is that, you know, we can do a lot with this information if we just find out ways to deal with it, and that will allow us to accomplish a really important social goal. And I'll come back to what that goal is. The key quote of the paper is often quoted is this, with a wealth of information comes a poverty of attention and a need to allocate that attention efficiently. This is the tension in which the entire in the internet industry currently exists, between the wealth of information and the poverty of attention. The technology we have, the technologies of Facebook, of Google, of Amazon, all of these different companies deal with this tension, wealth of information and poverty of attention. So what do we do to deal with this? 1969. Simon says, well, it's obvious, we need artificial intelligence. Today, every single company, Amazon, us, Facebook, everyone else is investing in artificial intelligence to address this problem, but we quite recently, as you saw Sundar say, moved into the notion of AI first. For Simon, this was an obvious arc of development that we would all go through in 1969. And you can generalize Simon, you can say that we are sort of working with a tension here that's not only about information and attention, you can generalize them and say that we are in a situation where our social environment is becoming more and more complex. What we need to do is that we need to realize that we have a wealth of complexity and a poverty of cognition. And between those two, we need to start developing real technologies um, uh, to help us learn. And that, Simon says, is the purpose of all this. Artificial intelligence, the reason for artificial intelligence, the reason for us to have a social, political dialogue about this, is this. Will you think me whimsical or impractical if I propose, as one of those goals of artificial intelligence, an order of magnitude increase in the speed with which a human being can learn a difficult school subject? So you can learn in a month what it would have taken you a year to learn otherwise. Social learning, the idea of social learning, is the golden promise of this technology and something that we need to shape because the shape of social learning will shape our adaptation as social beings as well together and that's where we have a great discussion before us much of the discussion of artificial intelligence have been one of substitution where we have said the machine will do this instead of you that was simply a research paradigm that came to be because that was the way you got money from darpa you say look this computer can do this better than a human being. You would get money from DARPA. MacArthur was joke McCarthy, when I met him, was joking about this and said, well, you know, we call it, look, Ma, what I can do, period of artificial intelligence. The real value of artificial intelligence is in complementarity, when you use it together with a human being. Any computer can beat a human being in chess. A human being plus a computer can often beat a computer in chess because complementarity gives us something completely different. Now, artificial intelligence will, through social learning, expand its own political design space. And I think that what we can learn from Herbert Simon, and what I would like to sort of send to the research world and to, to SIX, and to the work we do on artificial intelligence, because I do believe Europe is actually doing quite well. Startups in artificial intelligence in Berlin, in Paris, in the UK, are as many as those in the US. Many of them are bought by American companies, yes, but that's because there's no single domestic market for them to develop in, in Europe. So, what can we learn from Simon? We can learn, and I think this is essential when it comes to research, the AI is probably the most political technology we've explored so far, and the design of it is increasingly a political act, which means that we need to talk cross borders, not just research, but research and policy makers and businesses in order to design these technologies, which is why I think a research institute does really, really well. Thank you. Uh, of course, we have a lot of questions in the audience. 
Uh, any questions around? No. There is. They don't I'm dare. They don't dare to ask <laughs> the questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, safe. So, um, given the message that you just said, how is this related to Google, where you work at? Well, we, I mean, if you look at the amount of money we invest in research and how we have developed <laughs> a, an, a, an entire organization, part of which I lead for social dialogue, I think that is uh, very much a direct response to the kind of analysis you see here. That these technologies are not technologies that can be developed in isolation. They need to be developed in a social context, in dialogue with the world around us. Does it shape Google then? Yes, yes, certainly. I mean, look, there are several different things that, that we, um, where we have looked at, for example, facial recognition and said that the social acceptance of facial recognition is fairly low. There is no need for it, so we've decided that that's something that we want to. Or take, take the, the launch and then collapse of Google Glass, which is an interesting case as well, right? Because Google Glass could have been immediately mass marketed if we wanted to. We had the resources to do that. The logistics would not have been difficult. But the people behind Google Glass said, this is a technology that needs to be negotiated. So they consciously put it out in very small volumes, and we could see it fail because of the social weave and context in which it was asked to exist. That is a way of thinking of technological development that is deeply ingrained in what the company does. It comes from the original idea of release and iterate which is sort of a basic tenant of Google Faith. You release something, you iterate when you see it in use. The open innovation paradigm at work. And that is something that then comes back on a semantic and political and social level as well. Okay, uh, there we could hear his background in uh, public policy. Question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we... Uh, Can I get to throw yeah, a ball Another down? question? Yes. Uh, Bruce Lyme, KTH. Um, I wonder if you comment on the vulnerability of the architecture that's being set in place here. If we're going to be very dependent on AI and data analytics and so forth, uh, information from Google, if you will, speak to two, two components. One has been in the news recently, and that is, of course, the ability to hack systems and, and bring them down. And then the other is the... Um, uh, attention deficit that you talked about and that we accept uh, material now that is perhaps not deeply analyzed or vetted and you get a lot of misinformation coming at you and sometimes for political purposes I'm talking about the US election and so forth so comment on the vulnerability yeah. of what the architecture we're talking about I'd love to do that. And there, there are two comments. A vulnerability is a vulnerability in relation to an existing system, which means that every system has a vulnerability. So if you think about um, an, an offline system or the system we have today, it has an increasing vulnerability, not perhaps in its information architecture, but in the complexity that surrounds the system increasing so fast as to make the system obsolete. So you have to look at functional equivalence. When you look from one technical solution to another, the idea is that vulnerabilities should be managed in a better way, but they will always exist. So risk management across technological system shifts is really important. I think that in some senses, we are probably in a situation now where we see increased risk because we're at the beginning of a shift, and that needs to be, um, needs to be corrected for. And I think that there's a lot of work going on to do exactly that. When you look at artificial intelligence and security and, and hacking, etc., you don't want somebody to, to hack your self-driving car so it becomes truly self-driving. That's a bad thing when it happens. Uh, so what you instead want is probably certain security mechanisms. That research is essential and it's happening now. On the other question, I think, on the attention deficit, it is really difficult because the amount of information is growing so fast. And what is happening here is that we have to shift the view of information systems. Simon, in his 1969 article, says the main purpose of an information system is to restrict access of information, not provide it. And those restrictions, and this is really interesting, right? That's, his basic thinking in 69 is that the main purpose of an information system is to restrict information. When you do that, you open yourself to ethical, political, and I think, you know, general uh, scientific questions that, that have to be resolved. It's about the transparency of the filtering mechanism and the auditability. That's why the auditability question and, and problem is so deeply interesting. And there's a whole workshop and a new track within um, uh, the ACM on this stuff that, that I can strongly recommend because I think that's going to be a key issue for us as we move forward into this age. Okay, thank you. Uh, now thank we, you. we need a ball from you. Sure. And or I also a couple of them. Uh, wait, you can the choose green. between green 
uh, green, which is blue today, uh, red, which is the heart, and yellow, it's the pocket. Uh, okay, I, so uh, I will do this. There's an enormous amount of data produced. There's no scarcity. I'll take one of each. Uh, uh, great, good. <laughs> Thank you, and, and you'll have a backpack as well. And we have a gift for you as well. Thank so. you very much.